Ezra is a book of exile. It was written during the Israelites' exile from their land, along with Chronicles, Nehemiah, Esther, Daniel, and the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Here is a alliterated overview of the book of Ezra. First is return, that's the return of all the people to Israel, and specifically Jerusalem. Second is restore, the restoration of the temple. Keep that in mind, that's like the main theme. And then third, repentance, the repentance of the covenant-breaking People. It begins with a prophecy being fulfilled, like live, right before your eyes. Jeremiah promised in chapter 29, verse 10, that the people would be 70 years exiled and then returned. The first wave of exiles were taken about 606 BC, then two more waves, the last being 586 BC when the temple was destroyed. Now, I know that's a lot of information, but the first return was 70 years after the first wave was taken. All that to say, Jeremiah's prophecy came true 100%. But the Jeremiah prophecy isn't the only one being fulfilled. In Isaiah 40, 428 it says, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, he shall fulfill my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. That's a prophecy, and all of those things are about to happen. Here's a lesson. God does what he says he's gonna do. Okay, we're like a quarter of the way through this video and we're only in chapter one, verse one. Let's make some progress here. Come on. According to the proclamation of Cyrus, a bunch of exiles return to rebuild the temple, God's house. So there's Zerubbabel and a few other leaders who the Lord stirred up to return and rebuild. Jeshua was also a key leader, as well as Mordecai, who's Esther's uncle. Chapter two is a survey of those returning, like we have in Numbers and elsewhere. And in the survey, we see careful attention paid to obedience, making sure only descendants of Aaron are priests, etc. In chapter 3, Jeshua and Zerubbabel build the altar of God and offer just like Moses commanded. They also keep the Feast of Booths in Leviticus 23, which is that really cool one uh, where you're kind of camping. They use a bunch of money and resources that Cyrus sent them with to find skilled workers to build the foundation of the temple. They finish the foundation and with trumpets and worship, they're singing like really loudly in worship to God. Some of the people who were older in the crowd they're like so overwhelmed because they saw the temple destroyed. Now, 70 years later, they're coming back and seeing the foundation laid. They're just like weeping with joy. The Bible says that it's so loud that people couldn't distinguish between the weeping and the singing. Just one massive expression of emotion to God. But can there be a good story without villains and drama? Enemies of the Jewish people bribed leaders and frustrated the purposes of those trying to build the temple. These enemies tried to stop the work by weaseling their way into the worship, but the Israelites wouldn't let them. Some of the enemies had names like Bishlam, Mithridath, and Tabeel, and they were absolutely as terrible as their names. But their plan succeeded. The work stopped for 14 years. They stopped working on the temple. The Israelites had forfeited uh, the running of their own government way back in Samuel and Kings, and, and through their disobedience, now they're still slaves in their own land. They're not even in control. Prophets uh, Haggai and Zechariah were living right during these times, and they prophesied about the rebuilding of the temple, the project of Ezra. Haggai said in chapter one, verse eight of his book, go up to the hills, bring wood, and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. Talking about the temple. Zechariah said in chapter 8, verse 9 of his book, let your hands be strong, you who in these days have been hearing these words, then it says later, that the temple might be built. He's talking about the temple, obviously. And Jeshua and Zerubbabel, after a decade and a half, began to rebuild again. The Bible says that the prophets Haggai and Zechariah supported them. But there's more people who are complaining to the then king over Israel, who is Darius. We're gonna see this guy again in the book of Daniel. Instead of telling them to stop like before, Darius finds Cyrus's decree from the beginning of the book and tells them to continue. Then all of a sudden, the temple's completed. They celebrated Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, just like Moses had commanded. Now every story needs a hero, and not all heroes wear capes. We meet ours 50 years after the completion of the temple. In chapter 7, we meet the man who wrote the book and it's named after Ezra. The Bible says that the hand of God was on him. He was still living in Persia at the time, but he led even more people back and established even further the law of Moses and the keeping of the law. King Artaxerxes sends Ezra on his way with one, authority, two, money, and three, his blessings to go to Israel and enforce the laws of Moses. The reason for this 180 from the way the king felt before, if you're paying careful attention, is that most likely during the gap in this story, the whole story of Esther plays out, and Esther is most likely King Artaxerxes' mother-in-law, <laughs> playing into his grace and mercy for the Jewish people, as well as, obviously, the hand of God orchestrating this. This is a picture of my son. He's very cute. Here he is again. 
His name is Ezra. My wife and I named him this because of this next verse, and we pray that this will be true of his life. Chapter seven, verse 10 says, Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Ezra led the people safely to Jerusalem and led them in prayer and fasting. So Ezra leads the people, not, not my Ezra, the Ezra from the Bible. He leads the people safely to Jerusalem and leads them in prayer and fasting. And upon arriving, Ezra discovered that and in the intervening time in the book, the people had broken Moses' command. They had married pagans, which is like one of the main reasons they got exiled in the first place. The people they're getting married to are the people that Joshua and his army failed to drive out. They're the people who convinced the Israelites to serve pagan gods and judges and Samuel and kings. It's just a massive problem. Ezra thought he was gonna to arrive to a holy nation, but when he got there, it was looking like the nation that God kicked out before. Since Ezra was likely the author of Chronicles, in my opinion, and since he knew the law of Moses very well, this just devastated him. The Bible says that he sat appalled, but then Ezra prayed. He said, God, I'm ashamed and I blush to lift my face to you. We have forsaken your commandments. He wept and threw himself on the ground in front of the temple that they had rebuilt, but not obeyed. But then the people repent. They turn from their sins and they repent. Ezra calls them to turn from the people that they married and to turn away from the people leading them to idols and to go back to the Lord. And the people say, we'll do it. And they're like, let's make a covenant with God, just like the covenants of Moses and Abraham, but initiated by them. Then the next day, there's a ton of people gathered and they're all like ready to commit to follow Ezra's teaching and turn away from their sin. That's repentance. The book actually finishes with a list of those who were guilty of their idolatrous marriages. It's like a genealogy of negativity. So now, if it feels like the story ends abruptly, that's because the second second part of Ezra is the book of Nehemiah. So consider this part one. We're coming back for part two with the story of Nehemiah to continue the narrative of scripture, which is God created, man fell, Jesus promised, Jesus fulfilled, Jesus followed, Jesus returning, and the Bible is God's word.